Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Alfred Jelinek's novel, Lust. Now, this is a novel that I got a request to do a video about. Um, it, many of you uh, who've watched the channel for a while know that if you send me a comment or an email requesting a, uh, a video about a particular work of literature, uh, I will try and accommodate you. I would consider it a great personal favor in the future if uh, you did not request that I review novels or films or other works that are almost entirely about rape. Uh, just for my own not wanting to read it-ness, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that significantly. Uh, because that is essentially what Lust is about. It is 200 pages, the majority of which are about rape. Uh, specifically, spousal rape uh, within this small community in Alpine, Austria. Um, and so this is one of the, like, this is not a book I enjoyed. I'll, I'll say that right up front. Um, I appreciate what Jelinek does artistically. I appreciate the themes that she's working through and some of the techniques that she's using, and I'll talk about those. But it's just an unpleasant book to read. Um, and I, after I make this video, I will be giving this copy to Goodwill, and I will proceed to never read this novel again. So, basically, um, this Jelinek's style uh, has been described by Vera Boitier, or Boiter, I don't know, uh, as aesthetics of the obscene, and really lust fulfills that across the board. Um, the the novel is about a woman named Gertie, who is married to the director of a paper company. Um, they have a son, and for the first 120 pages or so, basically what we get is this sort of quasi-fascistic patriarchal family structure in which the director rapes Gertie multiple times per day. Um, like, he will typically rape her. And the, the, so, in, in this case, this is spousal rape because we never... He, because Gertie is never consulted about any of this. Some of these instances are physically violent, including including overt physical abuse, um, things like slamming her head into the tub, uh, things like beating her, um, slapping her around. Some of it is sexually graphic. I mean, it, it's all sexually graphic in a way, but some of it is more sort of I hesitate to use the word kinky, but because kink is not inherently a bad thing, but there is a sort of violent, fetishistic element to a lot of this. Um, it, it, what we might call, I don't know, extreme sexual practices. And, and I, again, I don't want to like pass judgment on anybody who's into any of don't physically abuse people. BDSM with consent, with safety limits, fine. Go nuts. Within limit. Um, so I, I like I don't want to kink shame anybody who's engaging in these practices consensually, um, but like the director in this novel will force Gertie to fillet him until she vomits. Uh, 
he will pee on her and force her to pee on him. Um, anal sex without any sort of preparation or anything like this. So things that, again, things that can be part of a normal, healthy sexual relationship here, they're done basically without consent because the director simply starts from the assumption that he has a right to do whatever he wants with his wife's body. So that's the majority of the first 120 pages or so. We also have interspersed discussions of the factory, the paper factory that, that the director works at, and the this sort of fascistic way that he runs that. And we have their son. The son who is a little fucking dick. Um, he's... So, actually, the other thing I'll, I'll say really quickly about the relationship between the director and Gertie is that um, the director is the most is the the richest man in the town, and he continually buys her things. It's there are there are points at which it seems like he conceptualizes this as compensation for what he does to her. And there are other points where it seems like that's just the way that they they both conceptualize this marriage. That he has more or less unlimited access to her body to do anything to her at any point, And she gets all sorts of fancy dresses and makeup and electronics and whatever it is. Their kid is in that same sort of vein, where he continually needs... He continually needs things. Um, so he's always got to have the latest sporting equipment. He's always got to have the latest clothes. Um, all this stuff. He's basically... Uh, he's a spoiled rich kid. Um... But the other thing that's fucked up about the child, about their son, is that, like, he seems to spend a decent amount of his time at keyholes watching his father rape his mother. And he's just, he's not concerned. He's not interested. He's not, like, he's a narcissist, really. I mean, he's only concerned about the gratification of his own impulses to consume. So, um, so then we get to the latter portion of this book. Um, Gertie meets a young, uh, sort of beau sabreur, um, uh, and it, who's come up for a skiing holiday. Basically he's come up to this, to this village for a skiing holiday. Um, he and his name is Michael. Uh, Michael and Gertie have sex, and she thinks that this is going to be some sort of developed, sort of fulfilling relationship where she can maybe live out an actual sort of romance. Whereas Michael has no interest in that. And, and at the end of the novel, he basically violently rejects her. Uh, in front of a, a group of people. So Gertie is just... can't catch a break. Again, this is a terrible, terrible story. I I didn't... I, did, I can't emphasize enough how much I didn't enjoy this. Um, the content is dreadful for these reasons. But there is... A degree of artistic merit here like the the things that Jelinek does that are the the way that Jelinek approaches uh, her themes and and the presentation of this content is actually rather effective um, and I want to so I want to talk about that so uh, the editor Friedrich Eigler identified three main things that Jelinek ac across her work uh, is particularly interested in. 
So consumer society and its commodification of human beings and relationships. Austria's fascist past and the systemic exploitation and oppression of women. And we can see all three of these explored in Lust. So the anti-capitalist element here, because Jelinek was uh, a communist for a, a time, um, so the anti-capitalist element here is is fairly well developed. It's 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 thorough, but it's also interspersed. Like this is one of the things I because I, I am going to tell you a little bit more about Jelinek's writing style, which is a very distinct sort of stream of consciousness, free association type prose style. Um, but like there are clear criticisms here of the capitalist system and the way that it commodifies factory workers, the way that it commodifies the poor, as well as the way that it commodifies the relationship between Goethe and the director. Because again, their relationship is premised on uh, him buying her things. So we've got this section, and I, 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 this is one of many sections where there's just sort of meditations on the poor and the working class and things like this. And I, this one just struck me, so I marked it. It says, The unemployed who have deviated from the kind of life intended by God and blessed in the sacrament of matrimony can just about afford to live, but the good life isn't on the cards. No adventure playground, no casino, no cinema watching, a lovely film, no cafe with a lovely woman. The only thing that comes free is the use of their own families. The boundary lines are drawn by sex, which nature surely can't have planned, at least not like this. Nature shares the good life with us so that we can eat of her produce and be eaten in turn by the owners of factories and banks. Interest would have the shirt off your, our bag. But no one can say what water does. It's plain to see what is done to the water, though, with the, the cellulose plant pumping its waste into the stream, which is in no hurry to get anywhere. Let it pump its poison somewhere else, where people like their streams to supply dead fish to eat. The women examining the shopping bags, which they use to get rid of the dole money. Consumers are well advised in the stores, where special offers are announced over the public address. Special offers are what they themselves were once, and their men were chosen according to their means, but now they are treated as the, the meanest creatures at the labor exchange, sitting at a kitchen table drinking beer and playing cards, a dog's life. But not even a dog would be so patient, kept on its lead outside the wonderful stores filled with fine wares that mock us. So actually, I'm just, I, I'm gonna... So we've got the, the blending here of consumer capitalism, um buying things, eating things, going to movies, going on holidays, things like this, along with this commentary on the commodification of human beings, particularly the commodification of women. Because again, um, it says, the women examine the shopping bags, da, da, da. Uh, special offers are what they themselves were once. So this idea of women as a product to be bought, a special product to be bought, and their men were chosen according to their means. Again, these, this economic component um, of, of an interpersonal relationship. So we've got those themes dealt with, and, and Austria's fascist past, and the way that that continues to shape uh, the country and, and the sort of ideals of the country are dealt with here as well, especially in the person of the director. Um, but the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of, of this novel is the distinct writing style. And you've got a sense of it from this passage that I read where we have these sort of odd stream of consciousness and free association approaches like uh, this phrase here and their men were chosen according to their means 
but now they are treated as the meanest of creatures at the labor exchange. So this is one of the things Jelinek does continually is she'll like take a word and play with multiple meanings of it to sort of string ideas together. So in the phrase, their men were chosen according to their means, this is of course uh, referring to their financial capacities. You choose the richest. Um, but now they are treated as the meanest of creatures. This is, uh, this is playing on the dual meaning of mean, because now this, this refers to worthlessness. Um, not, o not only financially worthless, but sort of worthless in an existential sense. Um, they are, they are treated as lower than dogs. And of course the, the metaphor of dogs there. Um, but like, we've also got, we've also got this random seeming shift. And this is mid paragraph, remember, where it goes from nature shares the good life with us so that we can eat of her produce and be eaten in turn by the owners of factories and banks. Interest would have the shirt off our back, but no one can say what water does. It just, there's no real transition. It's a hard turn of ideas. And this is the kind of thing that Jelinek does throughout. Um, it's, it's a striking element of her prose where the same paragraph may be talking about uh, Gertie and, and the director's son playing the violin. Then it may shift to... Uh, the director's role at the paper mill, then it may shift to a meditation on nature, then it may shift to the director violently raping Gertie. It's a very odd style that's in in many cases difficult to hang on to, but it's also there's a significance to this style, to this free-flowing almost completely disconnected approach to language. Um, and that's that the novel reflects a psychological dissociation. And, and, and this is often uh, an experience of trauma victims, rape victims, but, but victims of other kinds of trauma as well. Um, that events and ideas become jumbled. It becomes much harder to to maintain a clear line of thought. And so Jelinek, in this very unusual, very non-linear writing style, is is giving us a sense of that sort of traumatized experience. 